Welcome to the Ghostly Gallery Podcast, a place where we explore the world of horror in film, literature, television, and in popular culture. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the show. My name is Bruce Markison. As always, I'm joined by our skilled producer and co-host, Tracy Asteria. Tracy, how are you? I'm doing good, Bruce. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing all right. Anything uh, anything new you want to chat about before we get to the main event? Um, just looking forward to the Halloween season and uh, really looking forward to our special guest this evening and hearing about all the great scary movies on tap for this week. Yeah, that's right. This is our first episode that will air in October. And today we're very glad to have a return guest. He is back for his third episode with us, Dr. Jeffrey Thompson. Uh, Jeff is an author, historian, expert on the career of director Dan Curtis and the Dark Shadows franchise, and really a general authority on horror. Uh, Jeff is the author of three outstanding books. I have them all and I've read them all. The Television Horrors of Dan Curtis, House of Dan Curtis, and Knights of Dan Curtis. Uh, three excellent books uh, that uh, I believe are all still in print and all very much worth reading. Uh, Jeff, as always, we're very glad to have you with us. Welcome back to the Ghostly Gallery. Well, thank you very much, Tracy and Bruce. Thank you for having me. Uh, it certainly is our pleasure. So in this episode, we're going to put the focus on horror films being shown during the month of October in the lead up to Halloween. And one television network in particular is really going full bore. And this was uh, this is a network that Jeff made me aware of about a year ago. It's the Movies TV Network. And you can check out their website. It's MoviesTVNetwork.com. And they're going to be airing a slew of horror films throughout the month of October. It's not wall to wall. It's not 24 hour horror movies, but it's pretty darn close. They'll have dozens of vintage horror films being shown from the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, all the way to the modern day. So today with Jeff, we're going to focus on eight films that he has selected for us uh, that we find particularly good and interesting. Uh, one's from the 50s, one from the 60s, five from the 1970s, and also one from the early 1980s. So, Jeff, we're going to do this in chronological order. We're going to begin with the 1958 film Horror of Dracula. It wasn't the first horror film that was produced by Hammer Studios, but it was really the one that put the studio on the map. So let's talk about this one. What do you like about Horror of Dracula? Of course, there's a lot to like, but give us some of your thoughts on it. Horror of Dracula is, is just a, a landmark movie in, in, for many reasons. Uh, uh, Christopher Lee plays Dracula for the first time. And um, um, as you said, uh, Curse of Frankenstein came a year before this. But Horror of Dracula uh, really meant that Hammer was now in the horror business and uh, plan to remake quite a lot of the classic stories, Frankenstein, Dracula, Mummy, Wolfman, and so on. Um, uh, horror of Dracula uh, is uh, visually beautiful, sumptuous sets, rich colors. It, it was uh, uh, made for about a half million dollars back then. That was a lot of money, but uh, still that probably was considered a, a fairly low budget movie, but it, it doesn't look low budget at all. It looks uh, quite uh, uh, elegant and extravagant. Um, Christopher Lee um, uh, was a Dracula with fangs. We see fangs on the vampire. Before we see Christopher Lee bearing his fangs, uh, Valerie Gaunt uh, plays an unnamed vampire woman who is being held captive in Castle Dracula, and we see sort of a side view of her fangs as she is uh, trying to bite Jonathan Harker. But then uh, we see that classic uh, shot of a close-up of Christopher Lee with his mouth bloodied and baring his fangs. Now, I believe that uh, a movie in Finland uh, was the first to show fangs. Um, 
uh, many historians say that Horror of Dracula was the first, but I think maybe there was one or or maybe two antecedents. And then, you know, a, a year before Horror of Dracula in 1958, there was the Turkish movie Dracula in Istanbul. There were no fangs, but I mention it because uh, it was the first Dracula film apparently to, um, um, to correlate uh, Dracula with uh, Vlad Tepes. Um, um, Vlad the Impaler, mm -hmm. just one or two lines of dialogue. You know, it was a th almost a throwaway line. But uh, of course, with Dan Curtis's Dracula, with Jack Palance and other Dracula films, it sort of uh, became, went into the popular mainstream consciousness that, yes, Dracula perhaps was based on Vlad the Impaler, among other. Uh, sources and other inspirations. Um, the uh, Horror of Dracula has great music by James Bernard, who um, mm. uh, composed the music for many of the horror, uh, the Hammer horrors. Uh, it's directed by Terence Fisher, who directed many of the best Hammer films, and written by Jimmy Sangster, who wrote uh, many of the Hammer films in all genres, and then uh, later uh, came to the U.S. and wrote episodes of Wonder Woman and Kolchak the Night Stalker and came here to Tennessee and wrote two TV movies. I was a paid extra in one of them, Murder in Music City, and the other, The Concrete Cowboys. And then over in East Tennessee, he wrote uh, Young Daniel Boone, a, a short-lived CBS series that was filmed over in East Tennessee. Nashville is in Middle Tennessee. So yes, Horror of Dracula is just terrific in, in every way. It, uh, it condenses the story of uh, the novel. It, it's not the most faithful adaptation, but it, 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 it does capture the spirit of the novel very definitely. Um, some of the characters are left out. There is no Renfield, for example, and some of the relationships are, are changed. Uh, the, the women become sisters and wives of different people. But um, but it, it's a terrific film. Um, uh, my uh, uh, Tennessee State University colleague, Dr. Jonathan Lampley, uh, cites Horror of Dracula as his favorite film. He's probably seen that as many times as I've seen Somewhere in Time and Psycho and some of my favorite movies. So um, it's always a treat to um, mm. uh, dig back into all of the Christopher Lee Hammer horrors. Uh, and they're always uh, even better when Peter Cushing joins the film uh, alongside his great friend, Christopher Lee. They play, of course, the adversaries, Count Dracula and Van Helsing. Yeah, it's a great combination that we really get to see for the first time. They had been in a in a movie before, but I don't think they had scenes together. So this was really the first time where we saw them interact with each other. You know, you talk about Christopher Lee. He has only a few lines of dialogue in contrast to Bela Lugosi in the 1931 Dracula. But even though he speaks only a few lines, uh, he has such a, a huge impact visually and this really was a film that made him a star, no? Yes. Christopher Lee had, had been an actor in, in many films before then, but uh, this was really his, uh, his, his big splash, his big break into uh, uh, the zeitgeist, especially uh, among us horror fans. Um, yeah. And I forgot what I was about to say, but um, um, yeah, it, it, it just, it, it, oh, um, well, uh, it, it will come back to me. But yes, Christopher Lee plays the part. Oh, uh, you said that he didn't have very many lines. Uh, that's regrettable. Uh, you know, he has such a, a, a beautiful speaking voice that I wish we could have heard him speak more. Uh, yeah. And and sadly, as the, the movies go on, he speaks less and less sometimes uh, toward the end of the run of the uh, more than half dozen Dracula films. He, he has more lines. But maybe Jimmy Sangster and the other writers were going for the novel's idea of Dracula as just an overhanging presence. You know, yeah. in that long novel by Bram Stoker, Dracula is not in it all that much, and yet his presence and his threat 
hangs over every page of the novel. Uh, back in 2018, I reread the book on the exact dates. Uh, you know, it, the, the novel is an epistolary novel, meaning it is written in the form of diary entries, letters, dated documents. So um, I, I, just, I just read along, uh, it took me almost all year, uh, with sometimes gaps of a, f of a few days or a week or two. Um, but uh, if, if that particular date came up on my calendar, I read those pages. Um, so, yeah, perhaps uh, Hammer was going for just an overall feel of Dracula and a feeling of dread in those movies, and they certainly uh, succeeded. Even in the second Dracula film, we call it a Dracula film, even though Christopher Lee is not in it, Brides of Dracula, starring Peter Cushing, Dracula is not even in it, and yet his, his presence is felt. Uh, yeah. So uh, maybe maybe that's one reason why Christopher Lee sort of was always in the background, but you can't miss him. Yeah, for me and a lot of people, Bela Lugosi is always going to be number one among the actors who portrayed Dracula. I think though, I would probably put Christopher Lee at number two on the list. How would you rank Lee among the actors who have portrayed the famous vampire? Oh, I think he's one of the very best. Uh, Bela Lugosi, Christopher Lee, Jack Palance, Louis Jordan, and a few others are, are, are the best ones. And, um, you know, there have been so many Dracula movies, so many Frankenstein movies, but uh, so far, neither one of those novels has been filmed faithfully and fully. But I wish, I'm amazed somebody hasn't done it yet, but with so many uh, horror fans and Dracula fans, I wish that somebody would edit together all of the Dracula films, lifting all of the best parts from them, because <laughs> almost every Dracula movie does a certain character the best or does a certain scene or moment from the book the very best and if someone could put all of those together we might approach a, a definitive filming of the novel it still wouldn't be complete but it it would be close yeah because you know so many of the of the movies uh um uh, the the Mina in this movie is the best, or the Van Helsing in this movie is the best, or uh, um, the, uh, we see Dracula old in this movie, or we uh, uh, we see uh, like in the Jack Palance the Dracula Dracula um, releasing the wolves from the zoo, things like that, and then of course we've just had the Last Voyage of the Demeter, not particularly faithful to what. Bram Stoker wrote because he didn't write very much, but uh, it certainly fleshed out th those seven or 12 pages of, of uh, the sea voyage. Yeah. And then it has been touched on in uh, some of the other um, filmings like um, the uh, uh, Netflix, uh, I think BBC, I think it uh, was with Klaus Bang or a few years ago. And uh, uh, so, but yes, that, uh, that's always been one of my fanboy wishes. I wish that someone <laughs> would would uh, lift every golden scene and moment from all Dracula movies and put them together. And same with Frankenstein. You know, uh, I think Dan Curtis's Frankenstein is the only one that involves the DeLacy family that the creature mm. stays with in the shed nearby for a while. So each one of those movies, Dracula, Frankenstein, and all of the monsters, um, each one of the films has something going for it. A lot of misses, but a lot of hits. Jeff, I had one last question on horror of Dracula. It has to do with a memorable scene. It's the final scene, that great showdown between Van Helsing and Dracula. I absolutely love it. Talk a little bit about that. Oh, for many years, I did a Halloween presentation at Tennessee State University where I showed film clips and read aloud scary stories and and i often showed that uh, uh final battle between dracula and van helsing um uh where um peter cushing puts the two candlesticks together his idea i believe and then that has been done in other uh productions such as on dark shadows and uh his uh his heroic jump uh, to grab the curtains and let in the uh, light and the uh, the uh, 
the withering and, and deteriorating of Dracula. Um, now, there, there is a Japanese print uh, 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 of uh, the Japanese release of the film that has a little bit more of that disintegration scene. It was discovered oh, about 15 years ago at a Japanese museum of art, I believe. Uh, only the last several reels of film, the first few reels of the film had been destroyed in a fire or something, but uh, the last 36 minutes um, remain. And so uh, there are some additional shots, kind of like the German edition of Psycho that has a, a, an extra stab and a few things like that. Um, so there is a, a little bit more of that disintegration scene, which, you know, uh, the special effects back then, of course, were practical and handmade, but you can't top that. That was very shocking and scary and well done of, you know, the, the hand coming up to his face and then all of him disintegrating. And finally, we just see dust and the ring. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's a fantastic climax of that movie, one of the best endings of a Dracula film, and many others, including the, the subsequent Christopher Lee movies, have tried to top the uh, the Dracula death scene in outlandish ways, but um, this one is a terrific one, and James Bernard's music, you know, adds so much to it. Um, so yeah, that that's just a memorable movie all the way around. Oh, wow. Um that's that's awesome, and I I have to say, Jeff, I really like your idea of reading Bram Stoker's Dracula by the dates. That is a really cool idea. I think maybe I'll have to make that a project of my own. Whatever sparked you to think of reading it that way? Oh, I don't know. I I love calendars. I I I paid attention to dates, and uh, because you know the movie i mean the the novel is just a series of dated documents i just got mm. the idea well i should read this on june 10th and i should read this one on july 1st and just uh you know make it uh coincide with uh, with our reality oh that's so cool i really love that idea okay um so let's move on to the next movie it is the 1960s film village of the damned so I remember seeing the 1995 version with Christopher Reeve when it was first released back, you know, on VHS a little bit after that. And I really enjoyed it, but I had never seen the original movie until last night. So I watched it and I have to say that that movie is fantastic. I was really, really surprised at how well made it was. Um, it was pretty awesome for the time period too. So why don't you talk a little bit about this film and why you enjoy it so much? Oh, I really uh, like it. I like the, uh, the British novelist, John Wyndham, uh, who wrote the novel, The Midwitch Cuckoos, on which this movie is based. And he also wrote The Day of the Triffids, which has been made several times, movies, TV, radio, uh, dramatizations. But um, uh, Village of the Damned, you know, it's just about an hour and 17 minutes. It's quite compact, but uh, makes for a very uh, tense suspense thriller. Um, and uh, the, you know, the, the children's glowing eyes are so memorable to us here in the U.S., but Originally, uh, that, that effect was not in the British release because uh, they, they thought that it was just too, too scary, too frightening. So uh, in the British release, the children just opened their eyes wide, but I think eventually uh, the glowing effect was added. Mm -hmm. um, the Sterling Siliphant, I believe, wrote the screenplay, uh, and he wrote the, I believe, I believe he wrote The Towering Inferno years later, but he, I think, is American and wrote the script uh, with the, the idea that the movie would take place in the U.S., but the plans changed and it uh, went to uh, England. And so the, um, uh, the director, Wolf Rilla, and the producer, over a weekend, rewrote it uh, and anglicized it. You know, it was mm -hmm. far too American the way it was written. And so uh, the filmmakers rewrote it to uh, tailor it for uh, a village in England, and it was filmed in, a, in an actual village about 12 miles north of London. Uh, and, and it had, certainly has a, a British 
a lot of British feel to it, uh, local color and everything. Uh, later, the director and producer said they weren't satisfied. They said they thought they could have done even better, but I think it's terrific the way it is. George Sanders is wonderful. Of course, later we remember him as the first and best of the three Mr. Freeze villains on Batman. Um, uh, and, and Barbara Shelley, speaking of Hammer, who uh, appeared in Hammer horror films as well. So uh, it, it's just a terrific cast. Uh, Martin Stevens, who, who plays David, uh, one of the major uh, child characters, who also mm -hmm. was in The Innocents, um, the um, uh, classic filming of The Turn of the Screw. Right. But uh, it's, it's terrific. It's, it's very disturbing, you know. Could you imagine um, uh, every woman of childbearing age waking up after that blackout pregnant, especially in 1959 or 1960, uh, you know, and the, and the movie touched on how it, it, it broke up marriages and, and, uh, and one woman killed herself uh, mm -hmm. because how could the women explain how this had happened? You know, uh, there was no explanation. And uh, the, the movie doesn't really give us an ironclad explanation other than it is of alien origin. And it happened in other parts of the world, Mongolia, Russia, and elsewhere. And um, uh, this village in England is really the, the only children who survived mm -hmm. uh, until we get to the sequel four years later, but that's a different story. But um, uh, so it, it just gave off a very disturbing, unnerving, creepy vibe. And, and uh, uh, around that time, you know, um, there were several movies like The Bad Seed and The Innocents having to do with um, you know, um, um, evil children or sinister children. And then later it continued with the omen and, and, uh, movies like that. So, um, I always enjoy rewatching it. Uh, George Sanders does a terrific job. Christopher Reeve plays that part in the sequel, mm -hmm. which is very American. You know, it, it's meant to be, uh, an American production and is just as American as this one is British. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I enjoy it very much. Now, the, the sequel, Children of the Damned, in 1964 is, is very different. Um, it's kind of like, um, um, you know, uh, how Curse of the Cat People is very different from Cat People and how Babe Pig in the City is very different from v Babe, a totally different vibe. Um, it's the, the, uh, the sequel is more like... Uh, a straight science fiction adventure. It reminds me of an episode of the Avengers or something like scream and scream again. So it's, it's very good. It's, it's, it's well worth seeing, but I much prefer uh, the 1960 original village of the damned. Oh, nice. I haven't seen the sequel, so I'll have to um, check that one out from, did you say it was from 1964? Yes. Uh huh. Children oh, my, of the Damned. Children of the Damned. Mm -hmm. I will definitely have to check that one out. I thought the movie was spectacular and the children were very creepy. And when I did see the 1995 version, I always questioned about, uh, I hope my children are never like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> just don't tell them that. But it was a fear. <laughs> so. But yeah, I, I did I did love the movie. And the original, actually, I thought was much better than Christopher Reeves' movie. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just watched the, uh, the remake with Christopher Reeve, and I thought it was pretty good. But you're right, it doesn't quite match up to the, mm -hmm. the first film uh, from so many years earlier. Uh, one thing that was kind of sad for me watching the remake was knowing, you know, Christopher Reeve, you know, died so young, uh, so much before his time. And also Kirstie Alley died just a couple of years ago. And uh, it was, it was kind of sad watching a film. I mean, yeah, it's 30 years ago, but um, kind of sad that those two leads, um, they both, they both left us and, and really left us before their time. All right, mm -hmm. uh, Jeff, we're going to move on to our third film. And, and this might be my most favorite of all the ones that you picked for us. From 1970, it's House of Dark Shadows. This is one of my top five favorite vampire films of all time. And really, it's one of my favorite horror films, period. It's probably in my top 10, maybe top 15. 
Uh, it's a, a film that gives us, once again, Jonathan Frid as Barnabas Collins. It actually came out concurrently with the television show. Uh, of all the films that Dan Curtis put together, and I know that you're a huge fan of his, I'm a big fan as well. Do you think that this is Dan Curtis's best movie? I would have to say Burnt Offerings is even better, but okay. um, House of Dark Shadows is certainly one of his best, and, and it, it was his first. You know, he, like Orson Welles and uh, a few other directors, he started out on a high. Um, so, yes, and, and at that time, you know, there were other Hammer films coming out like Lust for a Vampire and I think Taste the Blood of Dracula, but Cinefantastique magazine proclaimed that uh, House of Dark Shadows was the best vampire movie from the, the new decade of the 1970s. House of Dark Shadows came out in the summer and fall of 1970 after having been filmed in late March to May 1st of 1970 at Lyndhurst, the mm -hmm. historic home on the banks of the Hudson River in Terrytown, New York. Now, that's not where the uh, TV show was filmed. It was shot in a TV studio uh, in New York City, um, but Dan Curtis took uh, half the cast of the show on location to Terrytown and shot in the uh, uh, fabulous, you know, uh, Gilded Age um, uh, decorated rooms of Lyndhurst. And uh, because the film uh, retold the uh, original Barnabas Collins escaping from the chained coffin and appearing in Collinsport storyline, Jonathan Frid and Grayson Hall as Dr. Julia Hoffman were two of the stars. And so while they were busy filming the movie, um, the, the, the TV show had to continue. So David Selby and, and, and uh, Laura Parker uh, uh, took over the lion's share of, uh, of the um, episodes while Jonathan Frid and Grayson Hall and others like Catherine Lee Scott and John Carlin were away making this movie. Now, as I said, the movie is a, a, a much more um, uh, violent uh, graphic retelling of the 1967 storyline, which introduced Jonathan Frid as Barnabas mm -hmm. Collins to the TV show. Um, Willie Loomis searching for jewels, uh, opens a chained coffin and out comes Barnabas Collins, who uh, uh, is a vampire who has been chained in the coffin since the 1790s. And um, when Jonathan Frid uh, uh, began on Dark Shadows, he was intended to be uh, a villain. Uh, the show had just done a story with a phoenix fire creature, Diana Malay, who, um, you know, uh, caused mayhem in Collinsport, Maine for about three months, but then was defeated and left the show. And so the original plans were to uh, uh, just bring on this vampire in, uh, for about 13 weeks and he'll bite a lot of people and eventually someone, maybe Dr. Julia Hoffman or another doctor on the show would drive a stake through his heart. But um, when Jonathan Frid began playing the part, he got so much fan mail and became such a, a popular character uh, that uh, the show did not want to and could not kill him off. Frid played the part as a reluctant, guilt-ridden vampire, and that's what struck a chord with the viewers. And so um, uh, over time, his character was softened and he became much more heroic, and he, as well as Julia, became the centerpiece of the show. But when Dan Curtis and his writers, Sam Hall and Gordon Russell, made the movie House of Dark Shadows, they went back to Curtis's original idea of, in Curtis's words, a marauder, you know, <laughs> uh, a, a, a bloodthirsty supernatural monster who will uh, terrorize the family and bite people and kill people. And so then he, of course, would have to be staked and, and dispatched. So that is what uh, House of Dark Shadows is about. So the, uh, the the original actors from the show are playing their same parts. Catherine Lee Scott as Maggie Evans and Thayer David as Professor Stokes and so on. But it, um, uh, it is a much more graphic uh, retelling of the story and with uh, an ending that is suitable for a monster movie, but not suitable for an ongoing five-day-a-week 
soap opera because so many of the characters, including major ones, ended up dead. Um, but House of Dark Shadows was very popular. It made a lot of money for MGM, which was uh, kind of ailing at that time. So it propped up MGM in the year 1970, so much so that MGM wanted a sequel, Night of Dark Shadows. And uh, so that's when David Selby and Laura Parker took center stage in the film. But um, House of Dark Shadows is, you know, um, uh, still remembered uh, today by Dark Shadows fans, most of hu whom love the movie as much as the show, although some do not like it as well because of the shift in tone away from yeah. gothic mystery and romance to much more violent supernatural monster killing. Um, but, and then of course, and then for just horror film fans and vampire movie fans who may or may not have ever seen Dark Shadows, they have seen House of Dark Shadows and they, they like it very much. They remember it as you do as, as a landmark uh, vampire movie and one of the best from that uh, period of the early 1970s. You know, you mentioned the violence in this film, and supposedly Jonathan Fred did not like that. That may have been a major factor in why he did not do the sequel, Night of Dark Shadows. Assuming that that's true, that, that Fred was not happy with the excessive violence, do you think that was a legitimate criticism? Do you kind of see his point from, from his perspective? Yes, Um it, it, it's a fact that that Jonathan Frid did not care for the violence. When he was making the movie, he he was concentrating on doing his scenes. But when he finally got a look at the finished movie, he was uh, aghast because it was hmm. just far too uh, uh, brutal and gritty and violent for him. And uh, he was afraid that it would typecast him as a monster, as a vampire. So that's why he did not want to... Uh, uh, make the sequel. And, and he was disappointed because he had spent, you know, uh, years perfecting his TV persona of the, uh, uh, the, the guilt ridden, reluctant, uh, vampire with a conscience who, even though he does bite people and occasionally kill people, he regrets it and doesn't want to be the way he is. And, and uh, with Dr. Hoffman's help and others seeks to find a cure for his vampirism. So um, it and and if if you uh, saw a recent uh, podcast, Terror at Collinwood, hosted by Penny Dreadful and featuring Mary O'Leary, uh, a six-time Emmy-winning soap opera producer and longtime friend and business partner of Jonathan Frid, hmm. uh, the two of them went into this in detail and um, uh, said that uh, not only did Jonathan Frid not like the violence, but the parents who took their kids, who were my age at the time, in mm. 1970, I guess I was 11, uh, the parents were, were shocked when they took their children to, to see this and didn't realize that uh, the, the TV show was in a totally different vein and much tamer and more classic horror as opposed to all of this violence and staking and bloodletting. And so it's possible that, that the movie was one of the factors that led to the, um, the, the downhill um, decline of the show, you know, which was canceled in early 1971. Night of Dark Shadows came out months after the show was off the air. Right. So yes, it, it, it is very different. The, the two uh, entities have a very different tone to them, Dark Shadows, is a, a soap opera, which just happens to be about the supernatural, vampires, witches, warlocks, time travel. Um, but it still is grounded in, in people, uh, life, love, death, revenge, everything about that all soap operas do. Whereas House of Dark Shadows is just a rip-roaring, great monster vampire movie. You mentioned the Lyndhurst Estate in Tarrytown, New York. That was one of the outdoor sites that was used. Is it true that also the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery was a location? Yes. Um, yes, the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery is just down the street from Lyndhurst in, in Tarrytown. Okay. And that's where the, uh, the funeral scene was shot, Carolyn Stoddard's funeral scene, after uh, she, you know, is drained of blood by Barnabas. And then, of course 
very soon she will rise as a vampire. And her staking is one of the uh, memorable but very violent uh, moments in the film. So yeah, it, it was shot uh, uh, there. Uh, and, uh, and then the, the, the climax of this movie, which was another uh, memorable climax like Horror of Dracula, uh, where Barnabas is run all the way through with a spear, um, was filmed at the uh, Lockwood Matthews Mansion in Norwalk, Connecticut uh, in late April, early May of 1970. And then there were, I think there were a few other shots. Uh, oh, there was a, the restaurant scene is a restaurant called the Three Bears Inn and uh, hmm. uh, things like that. But the, the, the majority of the, sh of the film was shot at Lyndhurst and the entirety of Night of Dark Shadows was shot on the grounds of Lyndhurst, even the car chase, which is uncharacteristic for Dark Shadows too. Jeff, that final scene that you mentioned, did that happen like in a, in a chapel? No, it, it's an historic home in Norwalk, Connecticut, which uh, I understand at the time in 1970 really looked like that. It was abandoned and in ruins. Okay. Uh, now it has been beautifully redone, and I think it's, uh, it's used for offices, local government offices or something. I toured it years ago, so it, it's, it looks beautiful now, but... I think back then it was a ruin like that, mm. but no, it, as far as I know, it was never a chapel. I believe it was, you know, a, uh, a private home, Lockwood Matthews with one T mansion in Norwalk, uh, Connecticut. Yeah. But yes, it, it did. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, I went, I walked down the stairs, you know, when I was there, the stairs that Maggie in a daze walks down, uh, to meet Barnabas to become his vampire bride. And so it, yes, it is a very elaborate building. And I love God. that. I love that final scene. I, I just think the way they shot it, it's so atmospheric. It, it has a surreal nature to it. I think it's just wonderful. Yes. Robert Colbert's music, uh, uh, adds so much to it. Uh, music that he was reused from his and Curtis's production of the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde with Jack Palance and the fog, and uh, a bit of the slow motion, uh, which Dan Curtis admits uh, was uh, inspired by Sam Peckinpah. Mm -hmm. You know, he he tried he 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 claimed that the Hammer films really did not influence Dark Shadows. Although, to me, House of Dark Shadows is one of the best movies that Hammer never made. Hmm. But Curtis said that the Hammer films were really not his inspiration, but that. Sam Peckinpah and the Wild Bunch were, and of course that movie is quite graphic too, mm. and I believe uses some slow motion, and so did um, um, but Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and several movies around that time. <coughs> yeah, it's just a phenomenal movie. I think we're we're both in agreement that it's uh, it's right at the top of the list. Uh, Burnt Offerings, as you said is great that probably is the number one dan curtis film but house of dark shadows not far behind right. our next movie is another fantastic vampire movie and that's the made for tv production the night stalker from 1972. this is where we're introduced to darren mcgavin as carl kolchak this sarcastic abrasive newspaper reporter uh, ends up working for a small newspaper in las vegas he's hoping to revive his career there and he begins to study a series of local murders that appear to be the handiwork of a serial killer. But Kolchak soon comes up with his own alternate theory that the murders are actually being committed by a vampire. And of course, nobody wants to believe Kolchak. Nobody ever believes Kolchak, even though he's right pretty much every time. At the time of its release, this is a film that set records as the most watched television movie of all time. And there's no doubt it's a great movie, but why do you think it did so well? Uh, was it was it promotion? Was it publicity? Uh, was the, was the ability to get advance word out? Was that was that a factor too? In addition to being a great vampire movie, I, I believe so. ABC ran some promos for its Tuesday movie of the week, um, so people were aware that some wild new vampire movie was coming. And if they had the idea that Dan Curtis and Robert Colbert were doing it and Richard Matheson, 
was writing it, I'm sure even more people um, jumped at it. But um, I, I believe that, you know, there was some advance notice about it, but um, uh, I think it was just one of those things, you know, I loved the ABC movie of the week. I loved it. It ran from 1969 to 1975. And there were, there were often dramas like Brian's song and occasionally some comedies, but almost every week it was some sort of suspense or occult movie. And mm. Dan Curtis did several of them. And um, so uh, people by 19, January of 1972 uh, knew that, uh, you know, the movie of the week often uh, was a thriller of some sorts. And this one certainly was because it was a vampire. And it, it was just very different and refreshing, you know, most of the time when we think of vampires, we think of horror of Dracula, you know, uh, in Transylvania or Germany or England in castles and uh, all of that atmosphere. But this was uh, uh, a different kind of tale told in a modern American city. Richard Matheson, who adapted Jeff Rice's unpublished novel, said that the book had a cinema verite quality to him, almost a documentary feel. And mm. I think that's what Jeff Rice was going for when he wrote his novel, The Coal Shack Tapes. Um, uh, because Jeff Rice had been a, a copy boy and later a reporter at the Las Vegas Sun, where he had worked with uh, a, a, an unforgettable uh, uh, larger than life character of a newspaper reporter named Alan Jarlson. And their uh, editor was uh, a loud, uh, uh, irascible type who fired his reporters about 14 times, but then rehired <laughs> them. So there was always, you know, some sort of altercation going on. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so Rice took a, a lot of this from uh, uh, from what he had observed in Las Vegas in the newspaper business. And I think he also had worked in the business world or the tourism aspect of Las Vegas. So it all came together in a, a wonderful novel that for some reason he couldn't find a publisher for. But luckily, mm -hmm. ABC uh, picked it up and decided it would be a great movie and uh, went with it. And so asked Richard Matheson to uh, adapt the novel. And Matheson admits that uh, he didn't have to do much to it, that uh, most of it the characterization and the the events were already right there and some events that didn't make it into the night stalker matheson put into the sequel a year later the night strangler yeah um so darren mcgavin of course you know um played the part so uh, so memorably and of course simon oakland of psycho as tony vincenzo the editor so it was really just lightning in a bottle um uh, the uh, the input from Matheson and Curtis, the music by Robert Cobert, um, Darren McGavin, Jeff Rice, um, the director, John Llewellyn Moxie. Dan Curtis did not direct this movie. He produced the film and had right. a great deal of input, as he always did when he was producing and not directing. But uh, John Llewellyn Moxie, you know, who directed some Avengers episodes and... Uh, uh, Horror Hotel and The House That Wouldn't Die and uh, other ABC movies of the week always spoke highly of Dan Curtis and said, you know, he, yes, put in his opinions, but uh, he and I got along very well. We collaborated. It was a, a great time. And Moxie said, I, I still think the movie holds up today, especially the uh, the fight scenes where uh, the, the vampire is fighting off the police and getting away from them. And uh, because that was something that ha is hinted at in Bram Stoker's novel. And we see glimpses in the various Dracula movies, but you don't really think of a vampire as having superhuman strength, or at least you didn't until later when you saw uh, the Night Stalker and other uh, iterations of the vampire lore. So it just it just was just a, 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 a wonderful moment in television all the way around. And because there were only three commercial networks, um, many, many people watched it, just like with Trilogy of Terror years later and, and other landmark uh, 
TV productions of the 1970s, which are so burned into our minds because we were right there watching it and then talking about it in school the next day and waiting for the summer rerun of it or the late night movie mm-hmm. rerun of it uh, long before we could just pick up a VHS tape or DVD and look at it any time. We had to wait, you know, for, right. for that rerun uh, or that next showing of it. You know, there's no question it's a phenomenal vampire film. It's an absolute classic. But if you take Darren McGavin out of that lead role and put in an average actor, a guy with out the ability to be funny and coarse and charming the way that McGavin is, then this just becomes really a mediocrity, doesn't it? Yes, it would not have been as memorable because something else that's unusual about this movie is that Yano Skorzeny, the vampire, is not the star of the movie. He's not the protagonist. He's not the Christopher Lee Dracula or Barnabas Collins or Nosferatu or anything like that. The the protagonist is uh, Carl Kolchak. We see everything right. from his point of view and we identify with him. And uh, the, uh, the vampire is uh, boiled down to Dan Curtis's idea of the marauder, the the, the villainous antagonist. We don't really learn much about Skorzeny, uh, except a little bit of his history at a press conference, uh, things like that. So the focus is on McGavin as Kolchak. And now one thing that Richard Matheson did change in Jeff Rice's novel is that um, uh, Jeff Rice uh, had Carl Kolchak uh, as uh, coming from a, a family from the old country and listening to his grandfather tell him stories about vampires. And Matheson said, well, uh, I don't agree with that because if if Kolchak already knows everything about vampires and more or less believes in vampires, where 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 else can you go? Where can you go from there? So so he Matheson took away that angle and uh, uh, just made it uh, fresher and and much more new and real in that Kolchak, like all of us, has had no experience with vampires and knows just the basic facts of they can't come out in the sun and you drive a stake through their heart and things like that. So Kolchak and we, the audience, learned uh, as we went along, you know, uh, as the events transpired. Jeff, one last question on the Night Stalker. You mentioned the vampire. One of the great vampire names, by the way, Janos Skorzeny, or Skorzeny, I forget Mm -hmm. exactly how to pronounce it. Uh, Just a a name, it's a strange name, but it kind of rolls off the tongue in a way. And he's played by Barry Atwater. What'd you think of Atwater's performance? Oh, it's amazing. You know, he was a character actor. He pops up on Mission Impossible and Mannix and other things, but you would never, and the Twilight Zone even, you would never recognize him as he was made up in the Night Stalker. Of course, we didn't get very many good looks. We got a few good close-ups of him, but but most of the time we didn't really get a good long look at him. And uh, so that, until the, the, the end in the, here's another great climax to a movie, you know, in the, the old dark house where Kolchak finds him and stakes him. Um, but yes, Barry Atwater, the way he played it, it, he was very feral, very visceral and physical, and even with the snarling and, of course, the superhuman strength of, of tossing the policeman away and jumping over the fence. So, yeah, uh, Atwater did a terrific job. And, you know, that that name, Yano Skorzeny, was used later in the 1987 Fox TV series Werewolf, Chuck Connors. Uh, played a, a werewolf who had that name, but obviously that was a tribute to the Night Stalker, as so many things are. You know, Chris Carter, creator of the X Files, uh, makes no bones about the fact that yes, uh, uh, the Night Stalker movies and the TV show inspired me in in many ways to create the X Files. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. I'm a huge fan of the X-Files. I actually was not aware of that. So that's pretty cool. I've got some watching to do. I've already got my watch list on the go here from some of the films we've already chatted about. Um, 
So let's just move on to the 1975 movie Trilogy of Terror. Um, was that a TV movie? Is that correct? Yes, that was uh, another ABC movie of the week in early March, on March 4th, I believe, of 1975. Yeah. Um, Karen Black, who should have won an Emmy, uh, plays five, I mean, four different women in three different stories, all based on the writings of Richard Matheson. Matheson and Curtis collaborated on six productions and planned to do more, including a Western, but they didn't get the chance. Um, Matheson himself wrote one of the stories and his and Curtis's friend, William F. Nolan, co-writer of Logan's Run mm -hmm. um, and, and co-writer of the Burnt Offering script with Dan Curtis, um, uh, adapted the other two stories. But yes, that, that's another story that everybody at work around the water cooler and all the kids at school at recess talked about for days and days after it happened. Um, Trilogy of Terror. Uh, the original title was Trilogy in Terror. I'm glad they changed it to Trilogy of Terror. Um, and uh, the, the, the first story, you know, is uh, uh, a story of a, of a, of a very uh, a quiet, seemingly introverted school teacher, Karen Black, uh, who uh, apparently is blackmailed into beginning uh, an illicit relationship with one of her students, but all is not what it seems. And we learn a surprise near the end of, of that story. And um, uh, at the, uh, Skip Burton played the student and uh, he, he was much older than college age. He was Karen Black's age and actually was her husband at the time that uh, they made this movie together. Oh, and uh, the, the second story which features Dark Shadow star John Carlin and Tootsie star George Gaines, uh, is a story of two sisters, twin sisters, who are like night and day. They could not be more uh, different, uh, dissimilar. And uh, it's a story of, of jealousy, envy, hatred, and apparently voodoo. But once again, things are not what they seem, and we have a big shock at the end, which was a bigger shock in 1975 than it might be today because we've seen so many other things. You know, I, whenever we watch a movie like Psycho or Horror of Dracula or Citizen Kane or any of the, the firsts, we need to project ourselves back into that time, especially and when we read works of literature too, going back centuries. We, we should project ourselves back into that time and, mm. and think of such as The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. That was the scariest story ever written back then and still is one of the scariest today. But you can imagine how people uh, 160 years ago or more just were shocked at something like that. And it's still shocking today. Um, and then, of course, the third story of Trilogy of Terror is still shocking to us today. It's the memorable story of uh, uh, Karen Black alone in her apartment being pursued by the Zuni fetish doll that uh, the little chain falls off of it and it comes to life and chases her with its spear all around her apartment. Now, I, when I have shown uh, that segment to my students at Tennessee State University, sometimes they laugh. Um, and I can see where, you know, if, if you look at it in that way, it, it's humorous, but especially because my students have seen, you know, a dozen things like that, you know, in their lives. Whereas when we saw Trilogy of Terror, it was brand new to us. However, an antecedent is Richard Matheson's episode of The Twilight Zone with Agnes Moorhead uh, as the the uh, woman in the farmhouse and the, the tiny spaceman invades her home. So there are some, some precedents. And uh, even a year before Trilogy of Terror, Dan Curtis did a film called Scream of the Wolf, uh, which uh, in which Joanne Flug, a marvelous actress, is chased through her apartment by something. But of course, he and Matheson perfected it a year later in Trilogy of Terror, and then they come back to it in a movie we'll talk about in a minute, Dead of Night. But um, yeah, if, if you, well, with anything, with Dark Shadows, mm -hmm. with the Batman TV show, 
you can take it seriously. You can take it completely seriously and it still affects you in, in, a, in, a, in a very emotional and dramatic way. And that's what uh, the Zuni doll segment of Trilogy of Terror is. You know, if you're really identifying with Amelia, played by Karen Black, you really feel her terror and her horror. And parts of it even were, uh, ABC asked for parts of it to be edited because they felt it was just too scary to be put on TV. Uh, a, a scene where she uh, throws something through a window and tries to escape you know, from uh, out of a window, even though she's in a high rise skyscraper apartment building. Um, so uh, the audiences of 1975 were shocked and horrified, rightfully so. And ABC did uh, have one of its very first disclaimers, you know, parental guidance suggested one of the very first times that ABC put that on the beginning of a movie. So yes, uh, the uh, the trilogy of terror Zuni doll segment is fantastic. Karen Black is marvelous, mm -hmm. and Dan Curtis and William F. Nolan uh, revisited the Zuni doll in 1996 in Trilogy of Terror Two, in which Lisette Anthony Angelique on the 1991 Dark Shadows plays the three different women in this second trilogy, and uh, the Zuni doll segment is both a loose sequel to and a remake of this Karen Black segment with the Zuni doll. So it, it's worth seeing. And I, I've shown segments of that to my students too, especially the segment, the graveyard rats, which is still right. one of the scariest things ever on TV. Oh, so, wow. Um, yeah. Trilogy of terror is just wonderful. And I'm so glad that it's showing up on Sven Gulli and movies TV network both of which are owned by the same company. So that's why you have been seeing some Dan Curtis productions like the Jack Palance Dracula and the Night Strangler uh, showing up on both uh, cable channels, or I think they come off the airwaves too and uh, streaming. So yeah, oh, the movies TV network, I'm glad we're talking about it tonight because it shows so many wonderful movies, not just horror movies on Friday nights and now in October, but, you know, you can tune in and see everything uh, from all different time periods. The Thin Man movies, The Best of Everything, A Face in the Crowd, Valley of the Dolls, The Sand Pebbles, um, Blackboard Jungle, uh, Wild River about the Tennessee Valley Authority. Just any kind of movie from any genre and any time period. So I really like the movies TV network and I'm thrilled that all of these classics are going to air uh, throughout October, and we're going to see some more on Sven Gulli pretty soon, too, including some more Dan Curtis. Oh, interesting. I will have to check that out. Um, I'm not sure if we can get that here in Canada or not. I'll have to look for that. I already said off air that uh, I would buy it for Tracy as a <laughs> Christmas present. So <laughs> this is on record now. I I'm going to have to live up to that documented <laughs> yes yes and when it comes to me and money it's a good thing to have things documented <laughs> uh jeff another interesting film from 1975 maybe the most bizarre of all the movies we're talking about in this episode the devil's reign it came out in august it is bizarre but it's intriguing it's about a southwestern satanic cult uh, that actually ends up melting people uh the son of one of the cult's earlier victims determined to bring the Satanist down, but he faces a very difficult challenge because there's really a web of conspiracy around him. It sounds straightforward enough, but it has a storyline that runs from convoluted to, at times, a little bit incomprehensible. When I first watched it, I wasn't exactly sure everything that was going on. How about you, Jeff? Did you, did you understand it during the first viewing? Were you fully aware of exactly what this story was? Well, yes and no. It's it's certainly an acquired taste, but um, kind of fits in with a very, uh, uh, a very sub sub genre of horror movies, a horror Western mm. like Curse of the Undead and Near Dark and a few others, because it, it has a, a, a Southwestern setting. It was filmed in Durango, Mexico, but it's supposed to take place somewhere in the, you know, uh, Southwest United States. 
And it's, it's one of those movies that ought to be great because of the cast. You know, everybody is in that movie. Ida Lupino, Tom Skerritt, Eddie Albert, William Shatner, Ernest Borgnine, uh, John Travolta in a small part. And the movie was re-released after Saturday Night Fever to capitalize on that, mm -hmm. although John Travolta is barely in the movie. So with a cast like that, you would think, you know, that it, it would uh, be something really, really good. But um, it, it, it is very unusual and hit and miss. And um, uh, it, it dips into many different genres, not just a horror Western, but in the middle, it's like a there's a, a haunted house segment almost, you know, when Tom Skerritt and I believe Joan Prather go into the, the house and, and find danger. Uh, and then um, um, it was um, directed by a fine director, Robert Fust, who uh, is known for directing the two Dr. Fives movies. And uh, I, I love his 1970 adaptation of Wuthering Heights. That's a movie that I have shown to my students at TSU quite a few times uh, with exquisite music by Michelle Legrand. Uh, it's a, a, a fantastic adaptation um, of Wuthering Heights until the end. The ending is changed. Uh, and uh, like so many versions of Wuthering Heights, it, it covers only the first half of that novel. You know, um, a major character dies at the midpoint of that film, and then it goes on into another generation in the novel, and we rarely see that in film versions, but up until the very end, when a different ending is used, it's a, a faithful adaptation, a terrific film, wonderful, uh, and Robert Fust, you know, did, I think, the final program, and um, um, started out as a, a set designer, production designer on The Avengers, and then in the final season of the show with uh, in the Tara King episodes, Linda Thorson directed seven of them. So he's a marvelous director, but even he says the movie is too long. Even mm. he says uh, there's too much of the melting that that goes on for too long. Um, it, it's all, it's quite self-indulgent, self-celebratory. And it is an amazing special effect here again. This is before CGI and it was all, hand done and 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 you know done in real reality but it's just once we've seen it we've seen it and we see it very early in the movie when William Shatner's father comes back and and he is uh disfigured and begins melting away in front of Shatner and Ida Lupino who plays his mother so uh, the the end is just a little too tedious because we keep seeing the melting and keep seeing it but it um, uh, the movie, you know, taps into the uh, the uh, contemporary mindset of uh, people's fascination in the 70s with demonology, Satanism, the occult. There were so many movies uh, made along those lines, uh, theatrical films as well as uh, TV movies, Dan Curtis's The Norless Tapes and Back then, almost every TV show had a satanic episode. Um, right. Ironside, It Takes a Thief, The Name of the Game, Logan's Run, you know, uh, many TV shows uh, dipped into uh, Satanism in one episode. So it was a thing back then, you know, it, it was a widespread fascination with demonology and Satanism. And, and even the famous uh, Satanist leader, Anton LaVey, appears in the movie and is a consultant uh, mm -hmm. and um, adds, I guess, authenticity to it. Um, Ernest Borgnine has said that it, it, it kind of scared him and unnerved him. He, he said, I, I'll never do another movie about Satanism mm -hmm. because I, I didn't like it. I'm not going to make another one. Yeah. He also said, and I don't know whether this is factual or not, but he said that um, it, uh, the movie was financed by organized crime. Uh, wow. I don't know whether that is true or not, but it, it certainly is possible. So uh, it, it, it was uh, quite a taboo movie for, for many reasons. Um, 
So it, it's 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 a curiosity and one that you know any fan of seventies horror needs to see, but it's not one that I necessarily would go back to again and again the way I would, you know, Horror of Dracula and Village of the Damned and Dan Curtis's movies and all of the Hammer films and, and you know, Burnt Offerings and all of the, the reincarnation of Peter Proud, all of the great movies of the 70s that deal with the supernatural or the occult, the omen, all yeah. of them. You know, it's one of those movies that I think would be wonderful to try to remake today with better special effects and maybe a little more organized direction. As you said, Robert Fuse was an excellent director, but yeah, he does allow that melting. There's just way too much melting. It goes on for minutes and minutes and minutes. One other point about this uh, before we move on to the next film. Supposedly, the making of The Devil's Reign was marred by a series of accidents and mishaps and of course, some people attributed that to the fact that it was a film about satanic content. You mentioned Anton LaVey's involvement. Have you ever done any research or heard anything more about that? Were there actually accidents and, and mishaps that occurred on set? I've just read, you know, general facts about that, but but no specifics. But um, you know, there seemed to be uh, uh, some incidents on the, uh, in the making of the Omen too. Yeah. You know, I uh, I would not want to be in a movie like that because when the actors are saying their lines and calling up demons and Satan, I would be afraid that something would happen for real. And apparently right. maybe some things did happen for real in these movies. And uh, so, um, yeah, the, se several of the movies that deal with the occult or or Satanism did have some strange things happen. Now, it all could be coincidence and much of it probably was, but who knows, you know, um, we don't know. Yeah. It's not a great classic film, but definitely one that every diehard horror fan should see at least once. And if nothing else, that incredible cast is, is worth seeing too. Uh, it's especially interesting when Ernest Borgnine turns into a goat figure near the end. Yes, of that, the that is shocking. Uh, <laughs> really? Just, just like in, in the Hammer film, The Devil Rides Out, written by Richard Matheson, when we see that yeah. Baphomet goat uh, figure uh, sitting up uh, above the crowd. Yeah, so, so yeah, The Devil's Reign does have some some scares in it. Now, one of the criticisms was that, was that it was not scary enough. I, I I think it was disturbing enough and unnerving enough, but I guess for night by even by the time 1975, people wanted more. They wanted more sh frights and shocks and blood. But um, as you know, a, a southwestern uh, supernatural uh, family drama, it it um, succeeded, I believe. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Jeff, two more films to go. Dead of Night, 1977, another Dan Curtis anthology film. I think it tends to be overlooked. Maybe it's overshadowed by the trilogy of terror that we just talked about a moment ago. Uh, you've got three stories. The first stars a young Ed Begley Jr. as a vintage uh, uh, car owner. Uh, he renovates the car and it takes him back in time. There's a second story involving a vampire and then a really effective third story about a mother tormented by her dead son. Uh, what specifically do you like about this one, Dead of Night? Oh, I, I love everything about it. Uh, it. It has been on Sven Gulli and is going to come around on Sven Gulli again soon and be on the movie's TV network. So it definitely is worth checking out. Uh, Dan Curtis wanted... Uh, Dead of Night to be a pilot for a weekly anthology series, kind of like Night Gallery or Ghost Story or Tales of the Unexpected. That didn't happen. And as a matter of fact, he had shot the second of the three stories about four years earlier uh, as part of a, a, a never realized pilot for an anthology. So he just folded it into this new production. But um, yeah, Dead of Night here again with Robert Colbert's wonderful music is terrific. That first story, especially because uh, all three are written by Richard Matheson. Um, to, the second two are his own stories, but the first story, Second Chance, is by Jack Finney, who uh, 
uh, who was who specialized in time travel fiction, short stories like the third level. Jonathan Frid enjoyed reading that one aloud, um, and uh, novels like uh, Time and Again and its sequel from time to time. Stories like the Woodrow Wilson dime and uh, where the Cluets are a Cluet, a family named Cluet, slip backwards into time, and um, and of course he wrote. Jack Finney wrote The Love Letter, which Dan Curtis later made as a Hallmark Hall of Fame movie for CBS in 1998. Um, so Second Chance is not horror at all. It's, it's, uh, it's a wistful, nice, sweet fantasy uh, film about um, a guy who restores a, a vintage car and drives it along a deserted uh, back road and drives back into time but changes history in a good way, in a nice way. And um, uh, it ends with the protagonist, Ed Begley, and his young bride uh, driving off to their honeymoon in the uh, restored automobile. So it was it, this sweet film was sort of a warm-up for Dan Curtis's two semi-autobiographical films uh, that he made with his good friend Dean Jones, um, um, when every day was the 4th of July and the long days of summer and the love letter, which he made uh, later for the Hallmark uh, movie. Um, but it, it's wonderful. It, it's, it's terrific. Ed Begley Jr. does a great job. And lately we've seen him on young Sheldon and a few other things. The second is, uh, is another one of the best films that hammer never made. It definitely has a hammer feel to it. No such thing as a vampire based on Richard Matheson's story from 1969, um, with Patrick McNee of the Avengers and Anjanette Comer and uh, Horst Buchholz and Elisha Cook Jr., who shows up in The Night Stalker and in several of Dan Curtis's films. Curtis loved classic Hollywood and classic television and often used people that he remembered from movies and TV in his movies like Herd Hatfield and the Norlis Tapes and Elisha Cook Jr. and Scott Brady and six of his movies and, um, you know, uh, familiar faces in The Night Strangler, Al Lewis and Margaret Hamilton and John Carradine. So um, this story, No Such Thing as a Vampire, is a, is a claustrophobic story that takes place inside one house where a vampire seems to be preying on McNee's wife draining her blood every night and taking her to the brink of death. But uh, once again, there is a, a, a surprise at the end of the story, but it's um, it, it too is, is filmed, you know, with beautiful settings and costumes and a, 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 a backlot European street uh, that looks really uh, good, very universal like as in addition to all of the hammer touches and quite a lot of blood um, maybe that's why it didn't make it onto the air for four years, because it, it's a little bit more blood than you usually see, you know, in, on in TV productions from coming from the neck and things like that. Um, and then the, the last story um, uh, called Bobby, which um, uh, Mathis, I mean, which Dan Curtis and William F. Nolan remade in Trilogy of Terror 2 in 1996 with, with Lisette Anthony, stars Joan Hackett, who is always marvelous, and she later co-stars with Dean Jones in the movie I just mentioned. But Joan Hackett, who uh, uh, plays a, a grieving mother who will uh, uh, go to any lengths to, to bring back her drowned son, Bobby, even once again, dipping into the the Devil's Reign and the Norlis tapes and all of these 70s movies, she uh, calls on uh, the, the 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 powers of darkness and draws you know uh, demon on demonological circles and 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 uh, markings on the floor and and uh, summons Lovecraftian gods to bring her son back, and he's played by Lee Harcourt Montgomery. Uh, brother of Belinda J. Montgomery and uh, the same boy who a year later would, I mean, a year earlier was in um, Burnt Offerings for Dan Curtis. Um, 
And so he, it, he was a really good child actor. Yes, he, he really terrific. was. Um, he, he later went into the behind the scenes side of filmmaking and then I believe became a teacher also. Mm. Uh, but he showed up on Dallas and a few other things before he more or less left acting. But yeah, he was great in this. Here, here again, like Village of the Damned, this is another one of those evil child, uh, bad seed type movies. Uh, yeah. Because uh, uh, Joan Hackett's character gets more than she bargains for when she brings back Bobby, because at the very end, there's a really big surprise as to what is really happening. But before that, it's, uh, it's a, a very unnerving, disturbing cat and mouse game between Bobby, who has come back from the dead, but is very different from his old self. He's sinister. He's, he's even murderous uh, after a certain point and tries to, to kill um, his uh, mother, played by Joan Hackett, and chases her all over the house, similar to uh, the Trilogy of Terror segment. And uh, the, the, the terror just keeps getting ramped up more and more because of the, uh, uh, the uh, stormy night and the dark settings and Dan Curtis's trademark uh, low angles looking up at uh, the actors and Robert Cobert's music and the the silent interludes where there is no music, you know, uh, making it scarier and scarier until there's a final shot, kind of like the final shot of Trilogy of Terror that gives us a jolt that uh, reveals to us what is really happening and why Bobby is uh, bent on on uh, killing his mother. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, Trilogy, just like um, the Night Stalker can't really be topped, although the Night Strangler came very, very close. And just as tril the Trilogy of Terror Zuni Fetish doll really can't be topped, th the Bobby segment comes very close to that because the, the, the Zuni doll segment is complete fantasy. I doubt that there is any doll that comes to life and chases someone around her apartment with a spear. Maybe that has happened, but I doubt. <laughs> but uh, children, children have been known to turn on their parents. They've been known to kill their parents. And that is a very real horror. So, mm -hmm. so that makes the Bobby segment terrifying in a, in a very real way that can strike close to home. Whereas the Amelia story, like some of my students can laugh at, uh, is is fantasy, whereas Bobby yeah. is is a story of a, a a mother's literal worst nightmare. Very underrated, very effective anthology film, Dead of Night from 1977. That brings us to the last movie we'll talk about from 1980, a John Carpenter movie, The Fog. It received mixed reviews upon its release, but so many years later. It's now generally considered one of the more effective of the Carpenter movies. It has kind of an old-fashioned feel to it. Uh, great cast with Jamie Lee Curtis, Janet Leigh, Adrian Barbeau, among others. Uh, this is a movie that, um, that I really love. Uh, it's 1980, but it kind of feels like a, a film from, from years earlier. Yes, well, it, it essentially is a film of the 70s because it was filmed in 79 and was meant to come out at, at Christmas of 79, but was delayed until February of 80. So I count it as a film of the 70s. But yes, you're right. It, it's, it seems even older than that because it, it creates such a mood. It, cre it creates a whole town. It, it's, a, it's a great world building movie because uh, we really... Um, feel as if we're living there in Antonio Bay with the characters, uh, especially with Adrienne Barbeau, who is almost always by herself in the movie, except we, the audience, are with her and, and rooting for her. You know, she has one scene at home with her son and she talks on the phone to people, but most of it is just um, she is at her radio station, um, uh, first entertaining uh, and comforting the town with the uh, jazz, easy listening music, but then uh, warning the town and, and helping the townspeople uh, get through this uh, un unthinkable attack from the fog and the ghosts that it brings with it. 
I, I like the movie because um, I like the scenes at the radio station. You know, I, uh, I have taught at Tennessee State University and Nashville State Community College for years. Uh, but at the same time, uh, for many years, I was uh, the uh, a weekend announcer and part-time fill-in announcer at WAMB Radio, which was the big band easy listening station in Nashville from 1971 to 2013. And I was there for all of it except the first 10 years. The station ended with the owner when the owner died, sadly. And, and Nashville at the moment does not have a big band, uh, easy listening, beautiful music station. Um, but uh, I enjoyed seeing, you know, the, the radio station and seeing all of her equipment and, and uh, the music was interesting. It's, it's nothing that you've ever heard of because it would have cost too much if, if, if uh, the songs had been, you know, hits like I Left My Heart in San Francisco or anything you hear on the radio, the, the filmmakers would have had to pay for that. So what they used was what, what they called stock music or library music, which is music composed uh, for scenes in TV shows and movies where there's music playing in the background in a restaurant or on the radio, you know, not singing, but instrumental music that doesn't distract from the, uh, from the events of the film. Um, and, and you hear a lot of stock music in uh, productions like, uh, Oh, Ed Wood's movies, Plan 9 from Outer Space, and the Night of the Living Dead movie, George Romero, and uh, The Adventures of Superman. So it was interesting to hear that stock music, library music by David Lindup, Steve Gray, and a few other people that most of us probably have not heard of we, and have not heard their music, but that's what it was meant for, to, to be the, the background as it was. So uh, yeah, John Carpenter uh, did a fine job of directing the movie. Some people criticize it for being too fragmented because she was by herself all the time. And then we switched to another story with Jamie Lee Curtis and Tom Atkins. And then we switched to right. Janet Lee's story and the, the celebration of the town's 100th birthday. But, um, I didn't mind that, you know, uh, as a, a long, a lifelong viewer of soap operas, I want to see many different <laughs> stories and many different characters going on at the same time. So um, it and it just gave it fleshed out the town. It gave you a feeling of, well, this is a, a town and we're seeing almost everybody doing things in the town and going through some of the same things together. The attacks from the ghosts and things like that. And even out, out at sea approaching the town. Um, so, yeah, it is a, a, an unforgettable movie. Uh, it has an atmosphere all of its own. Yeah. There again, it's not. Uh, nearly as gory as the slasher movies that had come along by 79 and 80, but it didn't need to be. You know, there are some shots of, of knives and hooks going into people, but that's that's not what the movie is about. The movie is about the people in the town and what happened years ago that is now coming home to roost and coming back to, to haunt the descendants of the town and uh there are six people who are killed in the course of the movie by these ghosts and the novelization of the the film makes it clear that the six people killed are all descendants of hmm. the uh, the 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 people who a hundred years ago or whenever made that ship crash made it wreck so they could loot the ship uh the ship mistook a campfire for a lighthouse and wrecked. And so I, it's a nice touch that the movie starts with uh, John Hausman around a campfire telling ghost stories. That scene was added later to make the movie last longer. And there are a lot of nice Easter egg in jokes for us fans. Uh, John Hausman's name is Mr. Mackin, named for the Welsh writer Arthur Mackin, who, you know, wrote Tales of Terror and uh, some Lovecraftian names are thrown in there and uh, names of people John Carpenter worked with and made movies with are used. So, um, yeah, and, and it's, um, it's, it's, it's nice to look back at an early role for Jamie Lee Curtis. You know, she is so ubiquitous these days on movies and TV shows and winning an Oscar, but it's nice to see her, you know, at the beginning of her career when she was 22 and yeah. starting out and with her mother, but they made 
two movies together. One, the other one is a Halloween movie. Sadly, I don't believe they are in any scenes together in, in this film, but at least mother and daughter are in the movie together for the first time and the, the one of only two times ever. Yeah. So uh, that's a great touch. It's always wonderful to see Janet Lee. Um, I, I met her a couple of times at a book signing mm. and a convention and told her that one of my bathrooms is decorated uh, like psycho with a psycho shower curtain <laughs> and things like that. And she told me that several people have told her that they have psycho bathrooms in their homes. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, the fog is, is one of a kind. It, it's a movie kind of like Orca. Once you've seen it, you never forget it and you can't really compare it to anything else because it's unique. It has its own, flavor, even though you've seen um, other movies with killers and slashing and all of this and haunted and ghosts and things, but The Fog does it in a in a unique way. And uh, the music is so great. I uh, Music is so important to me in movies and TV shows. And, and uh, John Carpenter, with the help of some other electronic artists, um, did a great job with his music in this movie and in all of his movies. Uh, uh, his next movie was a, a he had a two picture deal with Avco embassy and the first one was the fog. And the second one was a year later escape from New York, mm. memorable yeah. music. And of course everybody remembers the Halloween music. So um, yeah, all of the things uh, came together to, to make this a memorable movie. The, the, the shots of the fog, the music, the, the uh, scenes at the radio station, the, uh, the people in peril like her son and uh, the other characters and uh, the weatherman who talks to her on the phone but ends up being killed. And, uh, and, and it, too, uh, it, it, it too was filmed like Village of the Damned. It was filmed in, in a small town in, in, uh, on the coast of California. And we get a little of the local color because uh, th that church is an actual church and uh, the lighthouse is an actual lighthouse. They're in two different towns, mm -hmm. I think, nearby each other. But um, so, yeah, it, it just builds its own world and, and we live in it with the characters. You know, there are some movies, the best movies, I guess, where you really feel like you're right there with the people and you want to be with them and you're living alongside them and you care about them and you're going through the events of the movie with them and, and the fog succeeds at doing that. Absolutely. One of John Carpenter's best and I think one of his most underrated as well. So those eight films that Jeff has given us uh, such great insights into are just a few of the many films That'll be shown on the Movies TV Network in October. Here are a few others. Uh, Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde, The Last Man on Earth, Them, Curse of the Demon, Dog Soldiers, a more recent movie, uh, From Beyond the Grave, The House That Drip Blood, the classic from the early 60s, The Haunting, The Beast Must Die, uh, The Night Strangler, whom uh, we referenced earlier, Magic with Anthony Hopkins, Nosferatu, The Vampire, Black Christmas, and Willard. For those wondering where you can find the Movies TV Network, it is part of the Friendly app, which gives you all sorts of stations, I think more than 50 stations total. So if you get the Friendly app, Movies TV Network is on there. You can also find it on the Philo streaming service, and it can be found on some over-the-air stations and cable systems. Go to the Movies TV Network site. It's MoviesTVNetwork.com. Click on where to watch, then plug in your zip code, and you'll see where this terrific network is available in your area. Our thanks go out to Jeff Thompson. Uh, nobody can recall names, specific dates, important facts, tremendous insights about film and TV the way that Jeff can do. Jeff, we really appreciate it. Great job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our guest has been uh, Jeff Thompson, uh, still teaching at the collegiate level and uh, a terrific writer and great uh, historian of the genre of horror. We appreciate Jeff joining us for this program. Our thanks also to co-host and producer Tracy Asteria. Tracy, thank you. Thank you. This has been an awesome conversation and my list continues to grow. So thank you very much, Jeff. This will be a great reference for anybody 
during the month of October leading up to Halloween. So we thank you, Tracy. We thank Jeff as well. Thank all of the listeners for joining us in this Museum of the Macabre. And we hope you'll join us again next time right here in the Ghostly Gallery.